Hello, I'm Lori Cole, and I'm about to read from the book By the Book by Lori Cole and uh, uh, Michelle, Baker. Michelle Baker. Yes, I blanked on the name, was going to give her real name, and that was not correct. I'm reading chapter 15, Bearing It Calmly. And I guess that means I really should put myself at the front, forefront rather than an image. There we go. All right. Wren paused at the top of the tavern stairs, not certain if she should continue. Did she really, truly want to be a thief? She'd never really stolen anything in her life. Oh, she'd borrowed people's clothing to dress up a snowman or sheep. But she always gave them back, even if they were a little mussed up afterwards. She wasn't like Sneak. She'd never taken money from anyone who just needed to survive. But then there was Bruno. He wasn't the type of thief that tricked people in alleyways by talking about kittens. And he'd known better than to try to take her key. Maybe that was what he meant when he talked about capital T. Maybe it's something special about him. Something very different. It seemed like everyone but her had something special. Hawk was the strongest person in Alpendorf. Falcon, the nicest, and Al the smartest. But she was just plain old Wren, good for nothing except getting in trouble. But what if she could use her talent for trouble that earned herself a capital T like Bruno's. What if she could become mysterious and clever and disappear the minute people looked away and steal things back from whole armies of brigands? Then she would be something special too. She had to do it. She had to join the Thieves Guild. As stealthily as she could, she tiptoed down one step at a time. It would probably be best to see the chief before he saw her, after all. Near the bottom of the staircase, she hunched down to peer round the wall. Bracing her palms against the cold plaster, she leaned in, impatient to see what the guild looked like. To her immense disappointment, it looked pretty much like an ordinary ale cellar. Some barrels and bottles were stacked up against the wall across from the stairway, and on the same wall, a target had been painted about three feet from a closed door. The wall was pockmarked with gouges, and several dagger hilts protruded from the target. Near the target, Wren saw a man seated at his immaculate desk, bent over a stack of papers with a quill in his hand. He looked more like a baron than a burglar, thin and aristocratic, with neatly combed brown hair and a short goatee touched with gray. His pale eyes were highlighted by thin arched eyebrows that gave him a, a saturnine expression. A fine cinnamon colored velvet cloak had been thrown carelessly over the back of his chair. This had to be the chief. Wren carefully rose and stepped upon the last stair tread. It creaked slightly under her weight and the man at the desk paused in his writing, unalarmed. Bruno, he said as he looked up. Not quite, said Wren, smiling broad broadly as she stepped into the room. The man's brows drew down fiercely. How did you get in here, boy? Wren approached the desk confidently. I'm Fox, she said. I'm Bruno's new apprentice, and I want to join the guild. The chief's eyes, which had been busily sweeping her from head to foot, narrowed subtly with suspicion. Bruno would have mentioned an apprentice to me, he said evenly. I'll ask again, how did you get in here? I gave the password to Crusher just like any thief, said Wren with a smile, and then I sneaked down the stairs just to show you I can. I guess I should have been more careful with that last step, though. The chief did not return her smile. Where did you get the password? 
I got it from Sneak the other night when we were talking about the guild, replied Wren. He was very helpful. Well, well, muttered the chief to himself, picking up his pen and letting his eyes drift back to his work. I'll have to have a little chat with Sneak, not to mention change the password. He scribbled a few lines, then looked up, as though surprised to see Wren was still there. You may go, he said firmly. We are not taking in any new initiates at this time, especially not children. Wren shrugged off the chief's words. I can train myself. I learn pretty easily. I do not hand out licenses to untrained boys. So run along now and play somewhere else. Please, I really am good, said Wren. I can move without making a sound. Watch. Wren moved as furtively as possible across the room and then turned back to him. See? The chief put down his pen and buried his face in his hands in obvious exasperation. When he looked up after a moment, Wren was surprised to see his mouth had curled up some, into something that resembled a smile. Only then did Wren realize how sad he had looked before. The chief shook his head. Flattered as I am by your interest in my guild, he said, and by your transparent attempt to ingratiate me with your alias, I am simply going to have to ask you to leave. Bruno will be furious when he hears that you are using his name. Oh, will I? came Bruno's voice from the stairwell. Wren had never been happier to see someone in her life. Hi, she said cheerfully as she turning to look at him as he approached through the shadows. She noted with approval that he avoided the last step as he entered. I've come to join the guild, she informed him. Is that right, said Bruno, approaching to cuff her on the head. You know this little urchin? The chief thief asked Bruno with obvious ast astonishment. Sort of, said Bruno with a dismissive shrug. I seen him in the streets, gave him a tip or two. Bruno pulled a dagger out of his belt and sent it flying toward the fall, far wall. Any luck? He said to Wren as the dagger hit the exact center of the target with a sharp thwack. Wren stared open mouthed at this evidence of Bruno's skill. Not really, she admitted, wondering if she ever learned to throw like that. I guess I haven't proved that I'm good enough to join the guild. The chief frowned at Bruno as though Wren weren't even there. This boy claims to be your apprentice, he said acidly. Bruno drew another dagger from his belt and tossed it so that it landed precisely one inch above the other one. Apprentice, he said, glaring at Wren. That might be stretching things a tad. This wasn't the way Wren had hoped things would go. But you've been helping me, she insisted, and you won't be sorry either. I'll work really hard and I'll sneak around everywhere and I'll do everything you want and prove I'm good enough for both of you. Bruno bent down and reached into the top of his right boot to pull out a third dagger. It landed exactly an inch below the bullseye. The chief thief turned and frowned at the target. Wren followed his gaze and noticed that a drop of clear, oily fluid had begun to drip slowly from the center. Bruno, the chief said sternly, you know how I feel about the use of poison daggers in this guild. Bruno just grinned and pulled out his fourth dagger from his other boot. Times are dangerous, chief, he said. Gotta be on guard against those brigands. They don't fight by the rules. Bruno sent his fourth dagger flying into the target an inch left of center. Bruno tilted his head as his handiwork and then said casually, Fox would probably make a pretty good thief. He says he stole from the brigands. Bruno, I am surprised at you, replies the chief briskly. You know a boy this age could never comprehend the subtleties of the way of the fox. I know all about foxes. Wren interjected with a grin. I'm good fo friends with a fox, in fact. The chief stared at Wren in astonishment. 
What do you mean by that? Suddenly, Wren had the chief's full attention, and she wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Well, she said quickly, there's a fox I found in the woods, a great big red one. He helped me sneak through the brigands and steal back my brother's book, and then I helped him steal back uh, the chickens right out from behind the farmer's back. He actually winked at me, and he has such a wicked grin. She tried to demonstrate the fox's grin for the chief. The chief sprang to his feet, his face suddenly purple with rage. How dare you mock me, he snapped. Wren just stared at him with, his mouth, with her mouth open, wondering what she'd done wrong. The chief took in a deep breath through pinched nostrils. I don't know whom you've been speaking with, he said. That wretched sneak, no doubt. But the way of the fox is above your mockery. I have been chosen to reform the way of the guild, and I will not have my life's mission reduced to a feeble joke. Bruno, escort this urchin out of here immediately. Sorry, kid, Bruno said, carefully retrieving his daggers from the target. Gotta do what he says. But Bruno put his arm around her and guided her to the stairs. Halfway up the stairway, he leaned over to whisper in her into her ear. He thinks there's some sort of kind of magical spirit fox that appears only to him. And now you come along talking about seeing foxes too. I guess you stole his thunder. I didn't mean to upset him, Wren whispered back. Don't let it bug you. Wren sighed and leaned on his shoulder. If she was ever going to find his, her way into the guild, she'd have to find a way to undo that damage. The wind blew briskly on Hawk's tenth morning in Sigborg Bali, scattering clouds like frightened sheep across the sky. The fear and excitement that coursed through Hawk's body made conversation difficult as he is and his two brothers journeyed to the Kobold's cave. Falcon looked nervous too, and even Al had wrapped his cloak more tightly around himself than the weather could account for. The sun disappeared behind a cloud just as they approached the clearing leaving not enough light to illuminate the edge of the claw marks inside the cave. They would have to enter the darkness, wait for their eyes to adjust, and hope that the bear couldn't reach them. Just stand here until you can see, said Hawk as he stepped ahead of them. Don't go any further. The bear bellowed directly in Hawk's face. He leapt backwards into both of his brothers, then shuddered. Okay, maybe not even that far. Good to see that you're in control of the situation, said Al. Hawk grimaced and wiped bear spittle off his face. Gradually, the inside of the cave became faintly visible, although the details were lost in the shadows. All right, said Fal Hawk. Falcon? Falcon reached into his satchel for a half dozen dried apples that they bought from Hilda. Hawk watched him as he carefully tossed them, one by one, at the feet of the bear. Not seeming to notice, the bear lunged forward in a roar, strings of drool hanging from his jaws as the chain went taut. Ah, I guess he's not in the mood for an appetizer, said Hawk, his hand instinctively going to the hilt of his sword. Quickly, he pulled, took it away, hoping Falcon hadn't noticed. Al, try plan B he suggested. I need to concentrate, Al replied. Please be very quiet. The bear reared up on its hind legs, snarling and clawing wildly in the air. Al stared at it for what seemed like an hour. His lips grew thin and his eyes narrowed, but he didn't seem to be doing anything. Hawk's guts churned. Just standing and waiting was agony. Then suddenly... The bear gave a huge yawn and stepped back on all fours. After a moment, it began to sniff at Falcon's apples. Is it safe now? Hawk whispered. Theoretically, Hawk Al said, still hanging back. Well, I guess there's only one way to find out. Falcon's hand gra grabbed at Hawk's, but Hawk slipped away easily. He walked right past the bear who regarded him with only mild curiosity 
as it chewed on an apple. Looks good to me, he whispered back to his brothers who followed him, giving the bear as wide a berth as possible. There was a passage behind the bear, narrow and curvy and splotched with a slimy phosphorescent fungus. Hawk turned back to glance at his brothers. The eerie, livid light made them look like ghouls. Hurry, Hawk whispered. It may have hurt us, and we don't want to give it any time to prepare. As they continued forward, the passage grew even smaller, forcing Hawk to stoop and then crawl. Just as he was beginning to panic at the feeling of the rock closing in on him from all sides, the passage abruptly widened into a large, damp-smelling chamber. The chamber, too, was dimly illuminated by fungus. Across from where they stood, Hawk saw the kobold napping on the ledge. It sat with its legs crossed, somehow remaining perfectly upright as it emitted soft, wet-sounding snores. The kobold looked rather small and helpless all of a sudden, but Hawk had remembered too well the sting of smoke and the terror of being trapped inside the inn. It was all he could do not to decapitate the nasty little thing while it was asleep. However, he promised Falcon he would try to reason with it, assuming that it could even understand him. With one hand on his sword, Hawk marched up to the ledge, which put the kobold at exactly eye level. Wake up, he said sharply. I, Hawk of Alpendorf, demand that you... He didn't get to finish. The kobold leapt to its feet and hurled a handful of fire at Hawk's chest. Then it vanished. Frantically, Hawk beat out the flames on his shirt, cursing in, in pain and frustration. Behind you, cried Falcon. You little... Hawk whirled, drawing his sword and dodging another dart of flame just in time. Can I please kill it? He said through clenched teeth. Try and capture it, Falcon said. We're stronger. We just have to get close enough to grab him. Hawk sheathed his sword with a grunt of annoyance. Easier said than done. As soon as Hawk approached, the kobold blipped to the other side of the cave, nearer Falcon. Falcon raced towards it, but the kobold just vanished and reappeared far away from both of them. Owl watched with narrowed eyes, still crouching in the entranceway. Why doesn't it just reappear outside of the cave? he mused aloud. Don't give it any ideas, growled Hawk. Maybe it's just taunting us, said Falcon in dismay. Hawk ducked another fiery missile, then nearly stumbled over Falcon's boot as they both tried to race to the same spot. By the time they got there, the kobold was gone. Falcon, hold still, Hawk snapped. I'll chase it. Falcon obeyed without protest lifting his shield occasionally to deflect the kobold's attacks. Hawk began to feel like an idiot, racing from place to place, dodging flames. Another fireball struck him, and Al immediately calmed it before it could do much damage. Watch how it looks before, where it's going before it goes, said Al suddenly. It can only appear somewhere it can see. Good thing you're blocking the exit then, grunt grunted Hawk as he made another grab at the kobold in vain. Blind it, said Al decisively. With what? Hawk said irritably as the fireball whizzed by his ear to land sizzling on a wet patch of fungus. Without even thinking, Hawk grabbed a handful of the stuff and hurled it at the kobold. Years of practice with mud balls paid off. The fungus hit the creature right in the face. As the kobold stopped to claw at its eyes, both Falcon and Hawk raced over to it. Falcon threw his now empty satchel over the creature's head and grabbed it around the waist, pinning its arms. Hawk leaned down close so he could talk to the still wiggling kobold. All right, you little wrench, said Hawk. Can you understand what I'm saying to you? I want you to tell us exactly what... Suddenly the kobold kicked Hawk directly in the crotch. There was just enough time for Hawk to see Falcon's face go pale with sympathy, and then the pain hit. Hawk doubled over, cursing. As soon as he could catch his breath, 
Hawk fumbled for his sword. Let me kill it, he said between clenched teeth. Please let me kill it. Falcon shook his head. We need to talk to it and find out why it's doing these things. I don't think it can talk, said Hawk. Not stupid, it shrieked suddenly. Kill you! Hawk approached the kobold, now continuing to keep a wary distance. Why? he asked calmly. Are you setting fires in town? Revenge, the kobold spat. Against the baker, said Falcon, clearly baffled. And the little old lady? Baker got bread. No get kobold, the creature snarled. So make a little fire. Little fire go big. All that flour in the air, reasoned Al. That's likely what caused the explosion. Lady fill it, feed cat, Kobold went on, muttering furiously to itself. No feed, Kobold. Human's bad. He began to wriggle furiously in Falcon's arms. Humans die. The servants aren't putting out food for the Kobolds at the castle either anymore, noted Hawk. The shearmeister said it was considered a waste because the Kobolds were all gone. No, 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 shrieked their captive. Baron's brat, Baron's brat, say no feed kobold. Hey, said Hawk, giving the kobold a rough nudge with his foot. Careful how you speak of the dead. The kobold began to laugh. Either that or it was choking. It was hard to tell. Revenge, kobold revenge. Suddenly, Falcon looked up, his eyes going wide in the darkness. Revenge, he said in horror. Hawk, the stable master heard someone muttering revenge right after the baronet rode away. The baronet rode to the ca kobold's cave, said Hawk, suddenly understanding. And the bear got him. Hawk felt sick at the very thought. Suddenly the kobold began to thrash violently in Falcon's arms, nearly slipping loose. Hawk rushed forward to grab up its feet, while Falcon got a firmer grip on its upper body and head. The thing was surprisingly strong for its size. Hawk clamped down on the creature's ankles a bit tighter than was necessary. Is it true, he said, did the bear eat Barnard? Burn all, their captive cried, his voice shrill with hate. Kill all! Hawk kill Kobold if Kobold not tell about Barnard, he said fiercely. Don't kill it, urged Falcon. We need to tell the Baron what happened to his son. Do you honestly think it'll cooperate? Hawk scoffed. Hate you! Burn you! Die! There was a blinding flash of light as the kobold lit itself spectacularly on fire. Heat seared Hawk's skin and he jerked away with a curse. He beat his flaming sleeves against the camp damp cave floor, bruising his hands in the process. Help! he shouted to Owl. I'm trying, Owl said, a note of panic in his voice. After a moment, the flames died down as if of their own accord, and Owl slumped wearily to the ground. Hawk groaned in pain, cradling his hands against his belly, and warily approached the kobold to peer down at it. Falcon's satchel was nothing more than a pile of ashes. The kobold, face down on the cave floor, looked like an overcooked gray turnip. Spirals of smoke wafted from its large, hairy ears. So much for questioning it, Hawk said with a grimace. Wrap it up. Falcon looked at Hawk and winced. Without a word, he handed a jar of the healer's salve out of his satchel and then handed the jar to Hawk. Falcon opened the other jar and dipped his own fingers in the cool ointment. Hawk followed suit. The salve felt worse than the kobold's fire. Is this some kind of punishment? He complained bitterly as he jerked his hand out of the jar. Just use it, said Falcon grimly. I'm sure the healer knows what she is doing. Falcon slathered his, the salve onto his face and neck, clearly making a great effort not to cry out at the pain. Hawk worked some salve into his hands and wrists. After a few seconds of agony, he sighed with relief as the pain faded to almost nothing. See, Falcon said with a wan smile, 
It does work. Hawk shrugged. Okay, let's go, he said, heading for the kobold's body. He reached for it, then jerked his hands back quickly. The body was still too hot to touch. Hawk looked around for a moment, then his eyes came to rest on Owl. Hand me your cloak, he said. I beg your pardon, Owl said icily. If you'd rather, said Hawk, you can pick the kobold up yourself. Without another word, Owl unpinned his cloak and handed it to Hawk. Thanks, said Hawk, using the tattered fabric to shield his hands. As he began to lift the body, he noticed a strange glassy rock disc on the chain around the kobold's neck. Curious, he peered at it more closely. Hey, Al, he said, is this one of those rune thingies? Al was at his side instantly. Hawk carefully slipped the blackened chain off the kobold's neck and handed it to his brother. It is, Al said, and his voice was soft with excitement. I can see the spell. Rune there in the middle of the design. I'll just have to compare it with the book to see if I recognize any other runes. Let's just get out of here, said Hawk, as he wrapped the dead kobold in what was left of Al's cloak. Then he picked up the bundle and headed for the exit. Wait, said Al. What now? There's an invisible chest on the other side of this cave, he said calmly. If it's invisible, how do you know it's there? Hawk said irritably. Magic. Oh, a stupid question. Al crossed the cave and held out his hand, setting his lips into a thin line of concentration. There was a soft snick, and then Al bent down and reached into the thin air, pulling a trinket after trinket of what appeared to be a small rip in the universe. Kobold treasure. Al said scornfully. A baby's rattle, a fork, some tin soldiers, jewelry that may or may not be worth anything, probably all stolen from the houses in town from the look of it. We should return the things, Falcon said. They might have sentimental value. You carry the chest then, said Al. Falcon bent to pick up the invisible chest, then grunted. The goon must have carried this in for the kobold. I think we're all, we're both going to have to lift, lift it. I can do it, Hawk offered, uh, but I'm strong enough. I think that you should carry the body, Al suggested. I doubt either Falcon or I will come anywhere near it. They had to drag the chest and the kobold along the floor through the narrowest part of the passage until they finally reached the point where they could all stand upright. Then bearing their respective burdens, the brothers made their way toward the cave entrance. Hawk began to see daylight approaching, and he sighed with relief. Then the silhouette of a bear blocked the light as it lunged toward them with a large growl. Crap, Hawk said. The spell wore off. We should have killed that thing when we had the chance. He drew his sword. No, ordered Falcon. Let Owl calm it again. It killed the baronet. We don't know that for sure. Seething, Hawk replaced his sword in his sheath. They did know that for sure, and if this dark, smelly confines of the cave hadn't been making his skin crawl so badly, he would have argued the point further. Al concentrated for a moment. He gritted his teeth and sweat broke out on his brow. Hawk hadn't noticed the spell being that difficult before. Finally, the bear yawned and settled back down in the passageway. Hawk took a step forward, and the bear just watched. It hadn't left him much room, but Hawk managed to scrunch by between the bear and the wall. The kobold's body was light enough to shift into one arm so he could scoot sideways. Come on, he ordered his brothers, looking back at them. Falcon looked at the chest, the space between the bear and the wall, and then at Owl. It was obvious that they couldn't take the chest past the bear. Falcon watched, I mean, Hawk watched as Falcon walked up and tried to look the bear in the face. Falcon wrinkled his nose, apparently close enough to smell the bear's breath. Would you please move out of our way? 
He made shoeing no motions like he would with the sheep in Alpendorf. The bear yawned again, revealing a huge, toothy mouth big enough to take off Falcon's head. Falcon stepped back quickly, and Hawk heard a muffled sound from Owl that probably was a laugh. Falcon, said Hawk irritably, this is no time to be polite. All right, fine, Falcon said with a sigh. He approached the bear again and said in a firm voice, move. The bear just stood back at him. Falcon reached out and put his hands on the bear's shoulder. The bear's snout was right in Falcon's face and a stream of drool ran down Falcon's neck. Falcon tried to push the bear backwards, but it wasn't budging. Hawk, shouted Al from behind Hawk, Falcon, we need you to pull the bear's chain or we'll never get out of here. Al had a point. Between Hawk pulling and Falcon pushing, they managed to force the bear out of the cavern passageway. Then Falcon and Al picked up the chest and the three brothers walked out of the cavern. Once out in the daylight, Falcon put down his end of the chest and walked back towards the cave. What in heaven's name do you think you're doing? Said Hawk baffled. I've got to take the chain off the bear or it'll starve to death, replied Falcon. I assumed the kobold was feeding it. Hawk just stared at him. Falcon, he said in shock, the bear ate the baron's son. Even if it did, the kobold was starving it. It's only an animal. Then that animal should die, said Hawk. I feel that it's my duty to avenge the wrongs done to the Lord of Sigborg and his family. We've already avenged Barnard, said Falcon, gesturing to the still smoking kobold cor corpse. The bear isn't to blame. I'm going back in, he started to turn. Falcon, interrupted Owl gravely, I don't know how long that calm spell will last. It would be safer for all of us if you would just leave the bear alone. Falcon shrugged. I'll take my chances. I'm not going to let the poor animal just starve. Hawk rolled his eyes. Fine, but if the bear attacks, don't expect me to come to your rescue. Falcon didn't reply as he re-entered the cave. Hawk tagged along just in case. Falcon approached the bear, speaking to it in a soothing voice. It's all right. I'm here to help you. Slowly he reached for the chain and worked his fingers under it. The bear let out a low growl and Hawk felt his stomach clench. This may hurt a little, explained Falcon in a soothing voice, but you'll feel a lot better afterwards, just like Amelia's healing salve. Falcon was on a first name basis with a healer? Interesting. Hawk watched as Falcon pulled the chain up and off the bear's neck in a quick motion. The bear snarled at him. Falcon backed up slowly. You're free now. You can go find yourself something to eat. Just don't eat any people, okay? The bear's growl deepened and Falcon backed up more quickly. Suddenly, the bear reared up on its hind legs and bellowed. Hawk ducked out of the cave mouth and Falcon wasn't far behind. I think we should just get out of here now, Falcon said looking rather pale as he helped Al pick up the invisible chest. They all ran for the woods before the bear could realize that there was nothing to stop it from running after them. And that was the end of that chapter. Yes. And the next chapter is chapter 16, Just Rewards.